Welcome to the National Arts Club NAC at Home program. I am your host, Angela Louie. I am the co-chair of the Fashion Committee and on the Board of Governors here at the National Arts Club. Thank you so much for spending some time with us today. If you're not familiar with the National Arts Club, it is a 501c3 nonprofit based in New York City with a mission to stimulate, foster, and promote public interest in the arts and to educate the American people in the fine arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures, and readings. For more information about the National Arts Club, you can visit us at nationalartsclub.org or find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. I'm so happy to talk to today's guest, one of the most well-known and respected photographers in rock and roll to talk to us about rock and roll style, fashion, and art, Bob Gruen. Here is a little about him. From John Lennon to Johnny Rotten, Muddy Waters to the Rolling Stones, Elvis to Madonna, Bob Dylan to Bob Marley, Tina Turner to Debbie Harry, Bob Gruen has captured the music scene for over 40 years in photographs that have gained worldwide recognition. Shortly after John Lennon moved to New York in 1971, Bob became John and Yoko's personal photographer and friend, making photos of their working life as well as private moments. In 1974, he created the iconic images of John Lennon wearing a New York City t-shirt and standing in front of the Statue of Liberty making a peace sign, two of the most popular of Lennon's images. Bob has worked with major rock acts such as Led Zeppelin, The Who, David Bowie, Tina Turner, Elton John, Aerosmith, Kiss, and Alice Cooper. He toured extensively with emerging punk and new wave bands, including the New York Dolls, Sex, P P Sex Pistons, Clash, Ramones, Patti Smith Group, and Blondie. I just wanted to share with you that you can purchase Bob Gruen's latest book, Right Place, Right Time, The Life of a Rock and Roll Photographer through the link in the chat box. I wanted to mention that right now it would show, it will show us sold out because there was a lot more demand than there was current supply for it. But if you order right now, you will get a copy of the book in the next shipment. So um, go ahead and check that out uh, if you can. You can also ask questions for Bob in this chat box and we will have a little time at the end of the program for Q&A. Bob, it's such an honor to have you. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm really thrilled to be with the National Arts Club. Uh, sorry Bob, we can't be there in person, but uh, I'm glad to be here online. I'm so thrilled that we can at least have some virtual time together. Um, and I wanted to ask before you begin the presentation, we were curious as to what inspired you to get into this rock and roll genre. Oh, well, uh, rock and roll was kind of invented when I was. <laughs> um, I kind of grew up with rock and roll. I saw Elvis Presley on TV and on the Ed Sullivan show. And uh, it was just the most exciting thing for me. And uh, I, I talk about that in my slideshow. Wonderful. Um, and I, you know, I wanted to ask um, about this book. Where did this idea come from? I mean, this is uh, an extraordinary book. The, the photographs are iconic. So how did you come up with the idea to put all of that into a book? Well, I've made a lot of books of my photos, actually about 15 books of my photos. Uh, but I've been telling stories to people all my life. And uh, people often say, man, your stories are great. You should write a book. So I finally did. It, it was a long process. I tried many different writers. Writing is very different from talking because when we're talking, we use words like er and 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 you know and pauses. And I call that verbal punctuation. But when you write, you have to use actual punctuation. And it's quite different when you can't you know, express yourself in person. So it took a long time to really get my words and my feeling into a book, but I'm very proud of it. It's selling really well now. Uh, people seem to like it a lot. Um, and part of it was that I finally found a good writer. I worked with a number of different writers who put their own personality too much into it. Uh, but I, my friend uh, recommended a guy named Dave Thompson, 
uh, who lives down in Delaware, and uh, we worked it out together. And Dave kind of put all my stories, which I had recorded a lot of stories, and Dave put them into order. And he made a flow out of the whole thing. And then we edited it for a couple of months and got all the words right. And uh, finally, it's been out now uh, since October. I know that you've put so much work into this and all of this has accrued to our benefit. So, you know, we can't wait to see your photographs and hear the stories behind these powerful images. Can you share them with us now? Okay. Uh, I didn't just, you know, I, I've been working in rock and roll since 1965. And I just want to really thank the National Arts Club for letting me talk today. Uh, now, I didn't just visit the rock and roll lifestyle as a journalist. I live it and I enjoy it. I've worked with a lot of powerful artists who inspired the world and I've helped promote their image. It's important to me to capture the passion and the feeling of what's going on. And my, pa my path has been through rock and roll. I was in my early teens when popular music started getting faster and louder and News reports warned of the danger of this new sound, this rock and roll. It, it seemed it was stirring up passionate feelings of people. And the authorities were very afraid of that because it couldn't be controlled. <laughs> now there's often a feeling of anarchy when thousands of people are gathered, each free and expressing themselves in their own way with four or five musicians in the center. Nothing compares to the chaotic excitement you get in the middle of a loud live show. Now I think my work is about freedom, not just pop celebrity portraits. Rock and roll for me has always been about the freedom to safely express your feelings very loudly in public. Now, some people like that music playing in the background when they work, but I like it in the foreground. Now, I, I enjoy being from New York and I used to wear a t-shirt like this all the time. I got several of them whenever I'd see the guys who sold them on the sidewalk in Times Square. I used to give them to my friends and I gave one to John Lennon. I cut up the sleeves myself with a buck knife to give it a more New York feel. Now I'm most well known for this photo taken on the rooftop terrace at John Lennon's New York apartment in 1974. John had asked me to take photos for his new album, Walls and Bridges, in a quick and simple way so he didn't have to interrupt his recording schedule. He wanted to make different photos of his face so he could make up different expressions by flipping the cutout strips. And I put some paper on the, on the wall of his penthouse and we shot a, a series of shots. Then I took a few more pictures to use for publicity and I suggested that the shirt I had given him a year earlier would be perfect with the skyline around us. We had no idea it would become as well known as it has. But now I'll explain how I got to do this. I grew up just outside New York City. My mom and dad were lawyers who taught me to question everything. I learned that no is not an answer to accept, but it can be the beginning of an interesting conversation. My dad said it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Photography was my mom's hobby, and she showed me, she showed me how to develop and print my own photos. I took an immediate liking to photography, and when I was eight years old, my parents gave me my first camera, a Kodak Brownie Hawkeye. Now, one of my earliest memories was when I was five years old in summer camp, and I refused to get out of bed to go to the early morning flag raising because I didn't want to. I said, it's a free country, and I can do what I want, and I felt like that all my life, and I still don't like to get out of bed early. Now, at 13, I attended uh, my first concert at my local high school, the folk singer Pete Seeger sang of peace and love and freedom for all. And he encouraged the audience to sing along with him. I remember it as being one of the most thought provoking and fun experiences I ever had. He was singing about all the things I had been taught were morally right. But the next week, the local newspapers had letters fiercely attacking him as an anti-American communist and condemning the school system for allowing him to perform. I was shocked because his concert was the most positive message I had ever heard. And it became my favorite kind of music, music with a message. I like to take pictures of dramatic events. This is my first published photo, which made the cover of our local newspaper. I was coming home from junior high school at the time and I ran up to an adjoining rooftop to capture this shot of a fire. When I went to my high school prom, my camera was my date. I took photos of this for the school newspaper and the yearbook of football and other events. And I graduated in 1963 and I went to several colleges briefly, <laughs> including Southern Illinois University, where I again worked for the school's daily newspaper as a photographer. And I took this picture, the only way to get out of town, which is where I wanted to go. Then a sociology teacher in Baltimore Community College told me I belonged in Greenwich Village. And I soon found out he's right, he was right. And I've lived there ever since. Now I was listening to Bob Dylan, Tom Paxton, Phil Oaks, the other rabble rousers of the folk movement. I talked somebody into giving me my first photo pass at the Newport Folk Festival in 1965, when Bob Dylan famously played with an electric rock band. To me, it was a declaration that rock and roll was the folk music of America. 
It said that people booed, but actually it was not as simple as that, as there was many people cheering as booing and many just yelling at each other in the seats. People seem really afraid of any kind of change, of anything being different. The musicians I like sing about social themes, not only lust and desire like most pop music. Now, Bob Dylan has been a big influence on my life. In the mid 60s, when I was trying to explain to my mom how I felt, I played Bob Dylan's It's All Right, Ma, I'm Only Bleeding. I'm not sure she got it, but I did. Every time I hear a Dylan song, I hear something different and the meaning is just what it makes you think about. There's really nothing to figure out. I'm a huge fan, but I never really had a chance to talk to him. The one time he spoke to me was after I sneaked my cameras into a few of his Rolling Thunder tour shows where I took this photo. He wasn't allowing any photography, but I was driven to cover the tour as a news story. I happened to meet him several months later on the street and he told me he wanted to beat me up. He was angry that I had taken photos without permission and published them. For me, it was like meeting God and finding out he wanted to kill me. Uh, speaking of Bob, a funny thing happened when I uh, photographed George Harrison at Madison Square Garden and I went to the after party at the Plaza Hotel with his agent and his drummer, who were both good friends of mine. As we walked in, my friends went towards the bar and as I stood and looked around the room, George came in and he saw the room full of people and he said, who are all these people? And turning to me, he said, who are you? I said, I'm Bob Gruen. He said, you're not Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan's a friend of mine. Throw him out. Before I could say another word, I was pushed out into the hall. But back to my beginnings. I had a number of jobs before I was able to pay my rent as a photographer. One Christmas, I was Santa Claus. At the New York World's Fair, I got a job making Belgian waffles. I took photos of babies and I took photos of paintings in museums. I was really bad with the babies and the art photography was really boring, but I did learn a lot about color film, trying to reproduce the color of the paintings. My parents always wanted me to get a real job. They felt photography was a great hobby, but not a career. Now in those days, there was a theory that people should turn on, tune in and drop out. And I did. Little did I know that dropping out would actually be my road to success. By the late sixties, I knew I wasn't cut out for a nine to five job because I just wasn't able to make the nine o'clock part. Now this is a picture I took in the middle of the night with a full moon. It was a long exposure and I sat a short while and then moved out of the frame so you can see through me. I keep in mind the idea that we're all spirits and we're all just passing through here. Anyway, I had to be independent and work for myself. In the late 60s, I was living with this rock band first known as the Justice League and later as the Glitter House. They were discovered by the renowned producer, Bob Crew, who had them sing vocals on the soundtrack of the Barbarella movie and they got a record deal. The record company used my photos for publicity and they started to hire me to photograph other groups. I took a basic photo class at FIT in New York where I learned some studio techniques and I made this high contrast photo, which I used for my business card then. Now my photo influences include Man Ray for making art with photography, Henry Carrier Bresson for catching that decisive moment and Arthur Felleg known as Ouija for always being in the right place at the right time, which inspired me. And it's something I seem to be able to do, which is why I called my book Right Place, Right Time. Now, one night I went with friends who said, I must see Ike and Tina Turner, and I took some pictures. The place was called the Honka Monka Room. You can't make something like that up. And at the end of the show, as the strobe light was flashing, I set my camera for a one second exposure and I took several shots. This one came out right, and I think it's one of my best. A few days later, I took the pictures with me to show to my friends when we met at another Ike and Tina show. As I was showing them the photos, Ike walked by and one of my friends pushed me in front of him and said, show Ike the photos. He liked them a lot and he told me to come to more shows and soon I started to travel with them. I had one of the first portable video uh, recorders, the Sony Portapack, and I taped many of the shows for Ike and Tina. Tina liked that they could see the playback immediately after the show in the dressing room or the hotel room and she and the Ikeettes would improve their routine. Now, a collection of these videos are available on DVD or streaming called I Cantina on the Road 1971-72. My first album cover was for I Cantina in 1971. And this led to many introductions and new contacts, stories I talk about extensively in my book. <clears throat> now, I've been using my dad's simple Minolta camera, but I finally got a good Nikon. The first night I had it, I went to Madison Square Garden to photograph the Rock and Roll Revival show. I was standing on a seat trying to get a shot of Chuck Berry kissing his guitar when a guard started yelling at me to get off the seat. He literally lifted me up, but before he dropped me in the aisle, I got this shot from just the right angle. Now, in 1972, I was included in the first book of rock photos called The Photography of Rock. The writer for the book asked me to come with him when he interviewed John Lennon and Yoko Ono for a story about their backup band, The Elephant's Memories. The interview was at a hotel, and when we met there, he told me 
John and Yoko had just woken up and they weren't expecting a photographer. He said they were a little cranky, but they'll wake up some more and you'll f they'll feel better and they'll let you come up and they'll let you take photos of them and they'll like your photos and they'll like you and you'll probably become friends because that's the way they are. And that's what he said and that's exactly what happened. I said, I'll be in the bar, let me know when they're ready. <laughs> and 20 minutes later, as I was walking down the hall to meet John and Yoko, I realized I was so nervous, I was trembling. I knew I wouldn't be able to take photos shaking like that. So I stopped and I took a deep breath and I said to myself, it would only be all right if I just relaxed and was myself. And so I went in with some confidence and I got this shot of them. And since the story we were working on was about the Elements Memory Band, I asked if I could come to the studio, to the record plant that night to get photos of them with the band together. And they said, okay. At the end of the night, I took this photo of all of them and several weeks later, they contacted me and asked if they could use it in the artwork for their album sometime in New York City. After that, John and Yoko encouraged me to come by the studio and to work with them. They are the kind of artists I admire, encouraging people to think about peace and love. And like Pete Seeger and Bob Dylan, they were constantly being attacked for their views. Now, the first rock and roll show I saw was the Rolling Stones at the Academy of Music in 1965. It was the most exciting show I ever experienced. I was an immediate fan and I have been ever since. When I first met Lisa Robinson, she was a music columnist for the New York Post and was syndicated in hundreds of newspapers including the New Music Express in London. She was also the editor of Roxine Magazine. Lisa, an Lisa is an important person in the music business, and I'm very thankful for the many photo passes she arranged for me in my career. Today, she's the music editor of Vanity Fair. It was Lisa who got me my first photo pass to the Rolling Stones at Madison Square Garden in 1972, where I took this picture. For me, the Rolling Stones have always been the, been the image of rock and roll. Now, I worked with a lot of groups who were considered dangerous. The New York Dolls frightened people because they pushed accepted boundaries. They dolled themselves up, not as transvestites, but as beautiful men looking for a kiss. They dressed like dolls because girls like to play with dolls. When asked if they were bisexual, the lead singer David Johansson answered, no, we're trisexual, we'll try anything. In fact, they were the most macho gang of guys I've hung out with and they attracted more groupies than any of the others. I started traveling with them and I shot their second album cover. I also made a lot of videos of them which have been released as DVDs and streaming titled All Dolled Up and Looking Fine on Television. I met the Dolls and also Aerosmith because they both shared the same management as the Elephant's Memory. They hired me to photograph Aerosmith in Boston when they were just starting to become popular. I'm still friends with them today. Now, as an independent freelance person, you answer only to yourself, but you wake up every day unemployed. You can choose what you wanna do, Though often the pressures of life's expenses cause you to take on jobs solely for the money like these. But that's a choice too. I got many assignments from record companies for trade shots and publicity photos for hundreds of bands. This was my rent money. I photographed a lot of different events, groups big and small, day and night. Usually I was paid just 75 or $100 per job, sometimes a little more. Early album cover jobs paid only $300. Rock magazines like Cream or The Enemy would only pay 25 or $35 per picture. And photo processing and travel costs were very high, so I had to pay a lot to pay my bills. But a lot of groups I did for fun, new groups that didn't have any money. And my outlet for this was Rock Scene Magazine. Rock Scene was something we all did for free, like a fanzine. It was distributed by a publisher who made mostly comic books, so you'd find it in candy stores rather than at newsstands. For Rock Scene, we did photo stories about the whole rock lifestyle, and we didn't limit our stories to groups that were known, but covered anyone we found interesting. The pages of Rock Scene were alive with photos of touring and backstage parties. We were underground, outside the system, with funky distribution, but we inspired people, many of whom have since come up to me and said that after reading Rock Scene, they left home and moved to New York because we made it look like so much fun. And that always makes me feel good. You can see Rock Scene online now at rockscenester, S-T-E-R, rockscenester.com. Now living the, rock, <clears throat> living the rock lifestyle, I became friends with many of the musicians I met and I could take photos of them in casual settings. A lot of the bands I worked with were not famous when I met them. And I was able to record their early moments. I got to know the Ramones before when they couldn't even afford guitar cases. But I also worked with a lot of big name bands too. Lisa Robinson called me one day to say we were going to Pittsburgh with Led Zeppelin. I asked how we would get there and she said they had their own tour plane. When we got to the airport, Robert Plant asked me to take a picture of the band with the plane. This photo is on the first roll of film I took of them, but it's one of the most well-known pictures of Led Zeppelin. It really sums up the excess of the rock lifestyle of the 70s. 
Now I relate to things visually. For me, if this is show business, there should be a show to see. Alice Cooper always acts out each song in a highly dramatic way, and he's really great fun to see. When Salvador Dali wanted to make a hologram of the brain of the pop star, he chose to use Alice as his model. This definitely was one of the most interesting photo sessions I ever had. Dali was carrying on about the art of Confucianism, that there is nothing as, as ever really understood. And Alice was wearing $2 million worth of real diamonds protected by a large thug with a machine gun. Now the holograms are now in the Dali Museums in Florida and Spain, where you can buy a postcard of this photo. Now a lot of the bands I worked with were very wild. One time my dad was bragging to his friend that I was in Japan working with the rock band Kiss. Instead of being impressed, however, his friend was shocked and said that Kiss advocated wanton sex, drugs, and rock and roll, meaning all that was wrong and that they were a threat to society. When my dad asked me if this was true, I didn't know what to say. I personally, I thought, I like sex and rock and roll, and I don't think that's a threat to society. Now, I don't advocate drug use, and neither does Kiss for that matter, but I think there should be room for fun in a free world. Now, I had my first photo exhibit in 1974 at the Art Barn in Greenwich, Connecticut. Photography was only begin just beginning to be considered an art form, but it has since grown in popularity and value. I always wanted to sell my photos as art, not just published as news. My motto has been Ars Gratia Pecunicae, or art for the sake of money. A creative person wants to make art, but you have to pay your rent. So nowadays, Morrison Hotel Gallery sells original signed prints of my work. Now, the president of the United States, Richard Nixon, wanted John Lennon deported. And what was his crime? He dared to speak of peace in a time of war. I believed in the ideas of John and Yoko, and one of the main reasons I wanted to help them was that I felt their message of peace and love was so important. I suggested taking a photo of John in front of the Statue of Liberty to dramatize his case, the statue being a symbol of welcome to the country whose government was determined to throw him out. I was thrilled that John agreed with me to take the picture, but to surprise that not many news outlets published it, being afraid to be involved in John's political case. After he, di after he died in 1980, his picture became more popular. And I think that's because people relate to John Lennon as a symbol of personal freedom, similar to the Statue of Liberty. Now, people think I'm lucky because I worked with so many famous artists and bands, but I worked with thousands of bands that didn't make it. The luck was that a few of them did become successful, like Debbie Harry here. And there's always been a luck of timing in my life. I seem to be at the right place at the right time pretty often, which inspired the title of my book there. And one bit of luck in my life came when I told my brother I needed a car, but I only had a few hundred dollars. And he found his 1954 Buick for me for only 300 bucks, and I had a real rock and roll car. But mostly I got around town first on a bicycle and later on this moped because it was faster and I always had to make deadlines. Now there's a fear factor involved with being a free agent. And while I like to think that I'm not afraid of anything, personally, I worry about everything. I worry about getting up and out of bed in the morning. I worry about standing up because I might fall down. I worry about every decision I have to make, but I don't let it stop me. I live in fear, but I'm not scared. Fear is the energy that keeps me going. Winston Churchill said that when you're going through hell, you should keep going. Now I crave peace and quiet, but I thrive in chaos. In 1975, John Lennon took time off to be with his son, Sean. When Sean was only one month old, John called and asked me to come to take some photos to send to his family. He seemed happier than I had ever seen him. And he stayed away from public life for the next five years. But around then I was hired to photograph the Bay City Rollers who were hugely popular with run young screaming teenage girls. The Bay City Rollers had Roller Mania, the only other band to have a mania besides the Beatle Mania. And I made more money with the Rollers than any other group I've worked with. Magazines would license one Blondie shot, maybe two Rolling Stones pictures and 45 Bay City Roller photos to make a whole issue just about them. When the Rollers came to New York, they wanted to meet John Lennon. And I asked John if, and he said if they were still together in a group in five years, he'd meet them then. So I asked John if he could give him any advice. And he said, well, tell them to get all the money now in their own names, which was very good advice. And they should have taken it since in the end, they never did get what was due to them. Now, this is me in my studio in 1977. I found the BG letters on the street outside the Fillmore East Theater when it closed. The letters stand not only for Bob Gruen, but for Bill Graham who was the greatest rock show promoter who founded the Fillmore Theaters and was the first to develop rock arena shows. On the wall of his office, he had an engraved plaque with his motto. It said, don't give the audience what they want, give them what they should want. 
Now, by this time, I was spending a lot of time hanging out at CBGB's in Max's Kansas City, getting to know the bands of the emerging punk scene. This is the Patti Smith group, was one of the early bands that played at CBGB when the stage was still in the middle of the room at the end of the bar. When the Runaways played there, it was so crowded that the owner, Hilly Crystal, decided soon after to take out the kitchen and move the stage to the back, doubling the size of the club. And one Sunday afternoon, many of the bands that played at Max's gathered on the sidewalk out front so I could take a photo that would be the cover of the Live at Max's album. It was the only time they were seen together in the daylight. Now the New York Dolls were having problems with drugs and alcohol when Malcolm McLaren came over from London with a set of red patent leather outfits for them to wear. He got them into rehab long enough to do a few shows, but it didn't work out. Malcolm went back to England after making plans with Dolls guitarist Sil Sylvain to start a new band. While he was doing that, I helped David Johansson and Sil get a deal to play a few dates in Japan. And Malcolm got tired of waiting for Sil to join him in London and he started the band without him using Johnny Rotten instead. And well, the rest is history. I must say that sadly, Sylvain Sylvain passed away from cancer two days ago. He'll be greatly missed. But in 1976, I went to England for the first time and the only phone number I had was Malcolm's. He took me to Club Louise where I met many of the people who became the punk scene in England. It was there that I met, first met Joe Strummer and Mick Jones of The Clash. And later that week, Vivian Westwood and Caroline Kuhn took me to see them at one of their first shows at the ICA in London. I was very impressed with the raging power of their performance. Malcolm encouraged me to photograph the Sex Pistols, who seemed obnoxious at first, but in fact, they're nice guys once you got to know them. When I came back a year later, Sid Vicious had replaced Glenn Matlock in the band. Now, the Sex Pistols caused a big commotion when they used a comic curse word on TV, and they were widely condemned for it. They were just a rock and roll band, but the media made such a big deal about it. Malcolm had me join them to travel to Radio Luxembourg, where I took this photo. They were the kind of band that just naturally posed well together. Noticing them all sitting together, I got up to take a photo, at which point Johnny picked up his straw and the rest of the guys immediately got the joke and joined in. <clears throat> now, I sought out the class and I worked with them because they had a profound commitment to work for a better world. They encouraged people to know your rights and they began one song with the phrase, what are you gonna do now? I went on two bus tours across America with The Clash. You know, they say that the Sex Pistols made people want to scream with rage, but The Clash gave people the reasons. The Sex Pistols looked back in anger, while The Clash looked to the future with hope. I prefer people who are seeking solutions rather than just complaining about problems. John Lennon said there are no problems, only solutions. But I also went across America with The Sex Pistols on their tour bus. And while the shows were pure mayhem, it was actually pretty mellow on the bus mostly beer and reggae music. But when the door opened, all hell broke loose. They were young and arrogant and felt free to say whatever they wanted. And many people were insulted by their attitude and their rude behavior. But I must say that they did have some idea of what they were doing. One day when Sid and I were having a hot dog, I picked up my camera to take a photo and Sid said, wait, then he put more mustard and ketchup on his hot dog and he smeared it on his face to match his button. He was a mess, but he knew how to express it. Now this photo is now in the permanent collection of the National Portrait Gallery in London after it was chosen by David Bowie to represent one of the great personalities of the 20th century. Now in the summer of, John, in the summer of 1980, John and Yoko were back in the studio making a new album and they asked me to come to photograph them. I often stopped by while they were mixing their double fantasy album in the fall. This photo was taken on both John and Sean's birthday, October 9th. It looks like John is showing Sean the wonder of the recording world but he's really showing me the new computerized control panel that would mix the playback and move the volume controls all by itself. I took, in December, I took some more photos when they were working at the record plant. I had taken a few of John and Yoko standing in front of the big guitar and John pushed Yoko against the wall and he said, take one like this. This is what everyone wants to see. John was very happy that your album was selling well and moving up the charts and he was planning a world tour. We sat on the floor of the studio for hours talking about future plans I went home that night looking forward to an exciting year ahead, but a few days later he was shot. This was the biggest loss I ever experienced. It's not something you can get over, although eventually you get used to it and you learn to go on. Now, Tina Turner started a solo career in 1982 and she had a big comeback show at the Ritz in New York. Keith Richards and David Bowie were there to cheer her on. And it was great to see her doing so well on her own. Now many people consider the class the only band that really mattered, myself included. And after they broke up in the early 80s, I wasn't as interested in touring with bands anymore. 
with the advent of NTV and the music business becoming more corporate, bands started controlling their image more and it was harder to gain access to photograph them and to hold on to the rights to license the photos. I began to work more on books and exhibitions. In 1982, I had a big exhibition with a party at Studio 54. And then at another exhibition of my work, Yoko Ono came with her son's song, my friend Keith Haring. He was a very cool guy who made art that is full of the energy of life as he was. Keith made a drawing of me, which I've used ever since on my business card. And in the eighties, they started up the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Every year there's an induction dinner, which I enjoyed going to. In 1988, I took this photo of Bruce Springsteen, Bob Dylan and Mick Jagger at the after party show. In 1988, also, a Japanese publisher released a book of my, photo, of my Rolling Stones pictures called The Rolling Stones, featuring Keith Richard. They were starting to think about more about Keith as the real musical force behind the Stones. They put the photo of Keith with Tina Turner on the cover and it was released just as Keith released his first solo album. So my timing was good and he was happy to be featured on the book. He hired me to shoot several of his shows and his press party where this photo was taken. During his solo show, I saw a spiritual side of Keith that I hadn't been aware of before. And he seemed to be coming into his own as a musician. I, I felt I had to be there for the Sex Pistols reunion concert at Finsbury Park in London in 96. More people were there than I had ever seen them in all their shows they had played when they started out. And they were great. They play Sex Pistols songs better than anybody. But Iggy Pop opened the show and he was a tough act to follow. Iggy being one of the most intense performers in rock and roll. He's an animal on stage, but backstage, he's just charming. As you can see by the way Kate Moss is looking at him and the wary look in Johnny Depp's eyes, none too happy about the way his girlfriend was looking at Iggy. And Joe Strummer and I had become very good friends in the eighties and he stayed with me sleeping on my couch when he was in New York. I had a great time hanging out with him and in the late nineties going to the shows of his new band, the Mescaleros. My wife, Elizabeth and I would have to remember to bring our sunglasses when we went out to dinner with Joe because we'd always be up all night. And when you walk out of a bar at 8 a.m., you need your sunglasses. Last time Joe was in town, we ended the night dancing on tables at a downtown restaurant. He died of a heart attack a month later. He was a very powerful spirit and a voice of his generation. When the Rolling Stones announced their tour in the spring of 2002, I shot the event with film as usual, but also with a newly available higher quality Canon digital camera. I took the memory chip back to my agency and I dropped the film at the lab to be developed. By the time I got home 20 minutes later, my photos were on the agency website and were being seen around the world. I almost forgot to pick up the slides the next day because the job was done as the digital scans were already out there. And I've been using Canon digital cameras ever since. Now Yoko Ono returned to the art career she had before she met John Lennon. And I was very lucky to be in Paris when she performed her cut piece for the first time since the 60s. She sits alone on a stage as people from the audience are invited to come up and cut off a piece of her clothing. It shows how vulnerable she's willing to be to make her message of communication and trust. Now, one of the funnier photo sessions I had was Lordi from Finland, who won the Eurovision contest, the best of 45 countries, but they're not well known in the US. I took them to the middle of Times Square and we didn't even get a sidelong glance from the cops because you, ha you have to be more than weird to get attention in New York. Now, when people tell me I must have led a very exciting life, I tell them, yes, and I still do. If you wanna live an exciting life, you have to just get out of your house and go to it. Before lockdown, I would go out all the time to see shows. And I take pictures that I post on my website, bobgruen.com. I still like a show that inspires people to get up and shout, and hopefully we'll be able to do that again after the virus threat is over. Remember the pandemic of 1918 and 19 was followed by the roaring 20s. Now this photo of Courtney Love shows she wasn't about to stop just because she'd spent the previous night in jail. Now I met Green Day in the early 90s and they soon became my favorite band. Their songs are about the same kind of ideas raging against the system's lack of opportunity and hypocrisy, the lack of freedom that the punks have been roughly attacked for. But here is Green Day receiving all kinds of awards for the same sentiment. And I think that's great progress. There seems to be a thread of social commentary coming from folk music through rock and roll that continues today. And after I got to know them and worked for them sometime, Green Day took me on tour in 2010 to London, Dublin, and Paris. This photo from Wembley Stadium was a full page in the NME. 
39 years ago, I took this photo of the clash on the roof of the RCA building in Rockefeller Center, where you're on top of New York City. When I heard that Green Day was going to be taping a TV show in the same building, I suggested that we could go up on the roof and take a photo in the same place as their favorite group, and they agreed. The roof had been closed to the public for many years, but it's open again now. For me, it was a great homecoming to the old spot. This photo is now the cover of my book, Green Day, published in September 2019. The, book has fully, the band has fully supported my book with many quotes and a handwritten forward by Billy Joe Armstrong. They were going to carry the book on their tour starting last spring, but along with everything else, the tour was canceled. But of course, the book is still available online. Now, a few years ago, a grand exhibition of my work titled Rockers was presented at the Fape University Museum in Sao Paulo. My Brazilian rock star friend, Supla, was the curator who helped me pick out the 280 photos on display. So it was really amazing and attracted over 40,000 visitors. And for this exhibit, we created an installation called the Teenage Bedroom, which I've been showing on my exhibits ever since. It's based on the way teenagers cover their bedrooms, walls with pictures of their favorite rock heroes, made up of posters, magazine covers, and stories with my photos. This is the one we did for the Orphic Gallery in Rosendale, New York. The teenage bedroom installation was also included in an exhibition at New York's Museum of Modern Art. The exhibit was called Looking at Music and showed how media and music interacted in New York in the 70s. Now, if somebody had told me 40 years ago when I was starting out that my work would end up finding its way into MoMA, I never would have believed it. But now rock and roll is part of the art of our culture. Rock Scene, a monograph of my work with more than 500 photos, was published by Abrams Image. It's so popular it's now in six printing, which is very unusual for a photo book. And a few years ago, Abrams published the 10th anniversary edition of my book, John Lennon, The New York Year, <clears throat> with a new cover and 16 pages of previously unseen photos. And in 2019, in September, I'm sorry, 2018, <clears throat> the United States Postal Service issued an official John Lennon stamp featuring my photo of John. And there was a ceremony in Central Park with DJ Dennis Ellis, Postmaster General Megan Brennan, Sean Lennon, Yoko Ono, and me. <laughs> Recently, I've had exhibitions in Argentina, Japan, and in Seoul, South Korea, followed by a solo show exhibition in Havana. Now, last March, just before lockdown started, I went to Sao Paulo, we opened an, exi an elaborate exhibition of my John Lennon photos at the Museum of Image and Sound. It was open for three days, and then lockdown closed it. It reopened in October with limited admission and it's been sold out ever since. Now, thank you for having me here today. Uh, check out my website, bobgruen.com to see my catalog of images. And let me know if you'd like to buy any images. My main gallery is the Marston Hotel Gallery located in Soho, Hollywood and online. And I hope you get a copy of Right Place, Right Time and enjoy the story of my life. And now I'll be happy to answer as many questions as we have time for. So what would you like to know? Bob. Okay. All right. I just want to say uh, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. I've been uh, looking at various comments from people all over the world tuned in, and you have brought back a very special moment in time for everyone. And we've got people logged in, um, sharing their memories of these groups and also uh, their memories with you. Um, again, I want to remind everyone that they can order Bob's book, Right Place, Right Time, The Life of a Rock and Roll Photographer in the link in the chat box. It is currently sold out and on its, I think, fourth reprint, I believe. So if you want, <laughs> if you order now, you'll get a copy of the next shipment that goes out. They're, they're printing them pretty fast and they're printing them here in America. So they'll come out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So Bob, it's clear that when we look at your photographs, there's this visceral emotion that comes from it. Um, so I guess, you know, let's start with this question. A couple of your most known photographs are of John Lennon. They are iconic. Um, so what was it like to shoot him and what was your relationship like with him? Uh, you know, people ask me how I got to be friends with him and it's just like you become friends with anybody. You get along with somebody, you share a common sense of humor. Uh, I met him, they liked me. They actually lived around the corner from me, literally half a block from my building when they moved into Greenwich Village. I mean, that was just circumstance. Um, and in fact, we would visit back and forth a couple of times. They came to my apartment a few times. I went to theirs uh, until they moved uptown, <laughs> a nicer place. Um, he was very funny. He was always making jokes. It was really fun to visit with John and Yoko. Um, 
they actually, uh, things people don't really know is that Yoko was a very good cook and they were very uh, interested in having a healthy diet. Uh, in fact, in the 70s after Sean was born, uh, John took Yoko's advice and they went into a macrobiotic diet and they were eating very healthy but very delicious foods. And it almost got to be a joke because I would kind of try to come around lunch or dinner time, you know. So I remember <laughs> one time I walked in and John said, oh, Bob's here. Is it dinner time? <laughs> um, That's it's so amazing. Uh, you know, this other factoid fascinated me. That photograph of John in that New York City t-shirt, you know, in that famous photo, whose t-shirt was that? Uh, well, I had given him that shirt a year earlier. They were, they, they were not sold in the store. I really don't know who made the design. I wish someday I could find out because uh, I've certainly made it popular around the world. Uh, but when I first saw it, it was on a blanket on the sidewalk on Times Square. It was just these couple of guys. I don't know if they were from Brooklyn or the Bronx or where, but every once in a while, they would be out there with the blanket selling these t-shirts for $5. And I just liked the power of the graphics and I bought one for myself and then I liked it. So the next time I saw them, I bought a few. And then one night when I was going to the record plant, I walked through Times Square and I saw them and I, I picked one up for John and I cut the sleeves off to give it that New York look. But um, it, it's really, I've seen all kinds of designer companies and you know people around the world copying that design. I wish I knew who was the original people who made it but like I said it's just these guys selling them on a blanket on the street. I, I think it's so incredible that you know this photograph of this um of this iconic uh rock and roll rock and roller wearing this t-shirt and it belonged to you so that's so <laughs> amazing um when would you say was the most pivotal time period for rock and roll um style and fashion Oh, the most pivotal time? Well, I'm not really a critic, <laughs> but it does seem that early 70s, things were in flux after the 60s when people got into their hippie, you know, kind of very comfortable bell bottoms, long hair style. And then things were kind of open for anything. And uh, people started making themselves more beautiful. And, you know, uh, Mark Bolin and uh, David Bowie with the English influence and then certainly the New York Dolls influencing the world with their looks. And, um, you know, I think that was a pretty powerful time. And then, of course, the punks coming in with Malcolm and Vivian uh, picking up on Richard Hell's idea with putting the clothes back together with safety pins and then um, everything being, dis you know, deconstructed. And nowadays, everything's copied from everywhere. So who knows you know, what, mm -hmm. what's going on? We have this really great, um, let's, let's turn a little bit, let's turn our attention to questions that's asked by people, mm -hmm. um, by the viewers. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Breton from Ottawa asks, can you share any recollections of shooting the Alice Cooper group in particular in August, 1972 at Roosevelt Stadium, New Jersey, where um, uh, Alice had his pants shredded by the mobs of fans at the front of the stage and your shot, your shot specifically uh, appeared in Rolling Stone. Um, well, that was quite a madhouse. It was a stadium, it was a lot of people, it was a small stadium, but a big audience for, you know, rock band at that time. I remember the um, DJ Zachary uh, came out to introduce Alice and he was brought out to the stage on a camel uh, with a whole bunch of people waving feathers and things around him and you know, harem girls dancing. Uh, Alice and the band were amazing. There's one picture I remember in particular where the band kind of got into a street rumble fight and they're throwing garbage cans at each other. Alice has a fake knife in his hand. Um, it was really chaotic. What a night. <laughs> you know? That's amazing. Uh, and I think that might have been the night that really broke Alice because they brought four busloads of uh, journalists out there from Warner Brothers to see I, the show. It's incredible to hear uh, all of these amazing moments and that you you know, you know were able to, to experience it and capture it. Um, we've got to live through it. <laughs> yeah, and live through it and, and, and live to tell about it and share it all with us in your book. Um, were you at Woodstock? And if if you were, did, did you did you capture any, did you have any photos of it? Um, I was at Woodstock. I was there as a camper, as a fan of The Who. I saw the newspaper advertisement. There was a list of like 50 bands. In the middle of the list was The Who and I bought tickets. I sent the check out and I, I still have the tickets because you didn't need tickets. It turned out they didn't have a ticket booth. Um, and The Who were great. Uh, but I didn't go as a photographer. I wasn't really working in the music business yet. I was still kind of taking pictures of my friend's band. And um, I do have a page on my website with the half a dozen pictures that I got from that day, um, which is bombgruen.com. And if there's a search on the top, you'll put Woodstock or it's in the, 
which, which section? I think it's in the uh, uh, Bob's Rock Scene section or something like that. Mm -hmm. Or um, news stories. I think it's under news stories on my website. Yeah, and the website itself has um, a, a huge catalog of these images. So it's so it's a really There's actually a few thousand pictures on the website. Yeah. Um, can you share? Is, we have another question coming in that's uh, that's asking. Can you share some thoughts on Sylvain Sylvain and the critical bond that you and the dolls had? Well, uh, when I first met the dolls, I think Syl was one of the first I met, and he was a very positive force, positive energy. Uh, Syl was born in Egypt and came, uh, grew up a bit in Paris and then came to New York. And he was just a real hustler. He just knew how to get things together. And, and uh, before the dolls, he had a fashion company called Truth and Soul, he and Billy, the original drummer. Um, and then they decided to form a band. And it actually was with Truth and Soul as a fashion designer that Sylvain originally met Malcolm McLaren uh, at a fashion uh, trade show or something. Uh, so later when they were with the dolls, he went to see his friend Malcolm and that connected them again. Um, Syl was a real driving force keeping the band together. Uh, he did not fall apart from drugs like some of the other members did. Uh, he and David kept themselves pretty together at the time. Uh, the rest of the band uh, didn't make it very well. Uh, and then still had a great solo career. He's got a great record called 14th Street Beat. And more recently, there's another song about New York. Um, he was suffering from cancer for the last several years. Uh, he wrote a book three years ago, uh, also with Dave Thompson. It was actually with Sylvain that recommended Dave Thompson to me to write my book. And, um, and, it, and, and he started getting sick when he did the book tour. And uh, it's been kind of downhill. He was okay for a long time. He was doing a lot of painful treatments, going a lot of ups and downs. Uh, last summer, I spoke to him. He was still pretty okay. And then in October, uh, he took a real downturn. And um, two days ago, he lost the fight. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have a very, uh, you know, we have a very thoughtful audience. And one of the question for you, Bob, is in a parallel universe, how would a 20-something Bob Gruen work with his photography in a decade like 2020? Well, that's something that a person like Bob Gruen is going to have to figure out in 2020, because I already figured it out in 1965. <laughs> and I really have no idea. The world is quite different. Uh, we didn't have digital photography. We didn't have instant communication. Mm -hmm. uh, in the old days, I would take pictures at a show, and then you go home and you develop the film, and the next day you make prints or get copies of the slides, and the next day you'd send them out. At that time, Rolling Stone had a deadline lead time of six weeks, which means that if you got pictures to Rolling Stone today, it would be published March 1st. Mm. That was news back then. Uh, nowadays, before the first song is over, the whole world has seen the pictures of it. You know, you take one picture, you push one button, and everybody in the world can see it. So I really don't know. I do have some friends who are young photographers, and they get assignments. I mean, bands still need pictures. Uh, records still need to be promoted. Uh, posters still need to be made. Um, but it's a, a younger generation. And uh, I mean, the way I did it was just networking. I'll, tell, I'll say one thing is that every time a record company would hire me for a job to take pictures of a band at a after show party, I would take pictures of the publicist, whoever hired me with the band. And then they would put that picture on their wall and they would remember that I took it. Mm. So things like that to you know ingratiate yourself to the people that are hiring you, always to give more than you're asked for. Right. Uh, and you know, you can beat the competition that way. Is is there a modern day performer that um, you know you you might want to shoot uh, today? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I've uh, I've had a lot of fun with a lot of people. Uh, I'd like to see my friends play Iggy Pop or Green Day or you know, people like that. Um, I don't know if there's a modern performer that I'm really you know, want to shoot. Uh, I, I do wish I could have met Otis Redding. That was a big regret that uh, he passed away before I could get there. And uh, I met Jimi Hendrix once and uh, I, told, I showed him my picture of Tina Turner. I was just coming home the, the day I made the first big print I saw Jimmy Hendrix in the village. And I just took the print and I said, I want to show you this picture. And he said, oh, it's a really good picture. And I said, well, I'd like to take your picture someday. And he said, oh, we'll meet again. But then we never did. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah. that's what I'd like to photograph. But, you know. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, we've got uh, several people who were curious um, about if you have a favorite New York City smaller music venue that you like to frequent. 
Well, we spent a lot of time down at uh, Berlin or the Bowery Electric, you know, mm -hmm. some of the clubs run by Jesse Mallon. Uh, Jesse's a rock and roller himself. His clubs are run by rock and rollers. Uh, there's a really good vibe there. He's got a lot of new bands, a lot of local bands, a lot of out of town bands that are you know, coming up. Uh, so it's a really great place to see people. And it's a small, intimate club. It's not a big stadium. I mean, for me, if you're three blocks away from a band and you're watching it on a giant screen, you might as well be home watching it on the screen. Yeah. Um, you know, I like to be in a small club where you know, the, bar and the, band, the bar and the stage aren't more than 20 or 30 feet apart. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, you are known to, um, to develop a very trust, uh, trusting friendship and trusting relationship with um, your subjects. And we have a question which is asking, you know, it is a common forewarning not to become close to your subjects, but you have uniquely close friendships with John Lennon, Joe Strummer, Billy Joe Armstrong, and they were wondering if you can speak to this contradiction to the usual professional forewarning. Well, partly I didn't get any professional forewarnings. I'm kind of self-taught. Uh, somebody once told me that my pictures were just like the, uh, who's the guy who does the three, three, uh, what's it called? The, you know, the three uh, proportions of a picture or something like that. Anyway, I had no idea what she was talking about, uh, but apparently my pictures do that. Um, I didn't know you're not supposed, I mean, maybe you're not supposed to get close to your subjects if you're a journalist who's trying to study a subject, but I wasn't studying, I was part of it. And so these people were my friends and luckily I could make some, you know, make a living with my friends, uh, was a good thing. But I think I developed the trust because I never did them wrong. I never embarrassed somebody. I don't want to, you know, I, I'm not looking to take a picture of a guy out with the wrong woman just so I can make a hundred dollars in the morning and then that person will hate me for the rest of his life. Uh, I'd rather people like me and then they'll hire me again. Um, you know, you just got to do the right thing. I mean, that's part of it is to be in the right place at the right time, but do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because you you are such an inspiration to the world, um, th there there's a question on what advice you would give to younger rock and roll photographers. Uh, don't give up the day job. Uh, you know, it's really tough making a living in music business. I mean, there are, you know, you can go to a photography school and maybe get a job in a studio and become a uh, fashion or, you know, a higher paid photography kind of position. Uh, rock and roll photography is fun, but it's not uh, high paying. Uh, what I'd say to a, a young photographer starting out is have fun. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. uh, but don't expect to get rich. Right. Um, you know, this is this is probably one of the most asked question that I'm receiving, which is, you know, you you're you had incredible access to these um, amazing musicians, amazing artists. So looking back, when you turn inwardly on yourself, which personal qualities do you think allowed so many uh, artists and so many people to to trust in you? Well, uh... One thing I think is the pictures that I take, because for me, um, it's important to capture the feeling of what's going on and not just the facts. Uh, I like people to actually feel maybe that they can hear the picture, mm -hmm. uh, that they're actually there. And I think that people appreciate that that comes across in my pictures. Um, but as far as getting along with people, um, you know, uh, it, it's just a matter of having common interests, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were just wondering, um, you used to sit in a bus with sex, with the Sex Pistols for a week across America, and that is an experience of a lifetime. So <laughs> now we're wondering, today, what do you do? Oh, well, now I'm in lockdown like everybody else. We're not doing much at all, um, but I don't feel I'm missing anything because everything's canceled. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're kind of taking it easy up here. But other than that, yeah, I'm usually really busy, like I said in the talk. Just before lockdown, I was in Brazil for a week. Uh, there's an amazing uh, museum, the Museum of Image and Sound. It's a big place. They had two, it's a three-story museum and two entire floors where my exhibit at John Lennon, they had really fancy rooms. And, um, and so we've been traveling a lot. Um, I got up to silver status with my you know, mileage points because uh, it seemed like every month we were going somewhere. I was having exhibits or I was getting a job. I did a job for a fashion company. 
from Japan. Um, but now, I don't know, we're waiting to see when we can go outside again. <laughs> you know, let's talk a little bit about your art influence, influencing other artists for a moment. Um, Mark Jacobs, which is also your good friend, installed your work in a window display for his yeah. Laker Street Boutique, right? When, when my uh, rock scene book came out, he made a teenage bedroom. Well, we, we installed a teenage bedroom in the Mark Jacobs store on Bleecker Street in New York. Uh, oh. And he had a signing at his store. And I was, uh, I met uh, Mark, I was a surprise guest brought to his uh, 21st birthday party because he was a huge fan of rock scene and uh, a friend of his totally surprised him by bringing me to the party. And we've been friends ever since. That's, that's- In incredible. fact, my wife knows him from uh, going to Parsons where uh, Mark was going to school also. That's incredible. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about this one very unique photo um, that, well, they're all very unique, but there's this one that I, I find very funny. There's this photo that you took of Kiss where you went into a friend's apartment and they put on suits, right? Well, it wasn't a friend's apartment. They're wearing two of my suits. They're wearing um, two of your suits. So you <laughs> yeah. Kiss in suits. Can you tell us about that? That was such an incredible photograph. Uh, and it ended up being their album cover. Uh, mm -hmm. It was actually thought up by Cream Magazine, uh, wanted to make what's called a photo novella, which is a uh, comic book made of photographs. And it's a two page story. You can see it online if you look up Kiss Comics. And um, the idea was that Kiss was uh, in suits uh, and that was their secret identity, like their Clark Kent, as if with the makeup, you wouldn't know they were Kiss because they're wearing suits. Uh, when they came to the shoot, Gene and Ace didn't have suits. Uh, Paul and, uh, and uh, Peter got the memo, but uh, Ace and Gene didn't have a suit, so they're actually wearing my suits, which worked out because Gene is much bigger than me. And if you see the picture, the suit just comes up to his, the middle of his arms. I mean, he looks like a monster, like the Hulk breaking out of the clothes. Uh, so it makes him look even bigger. Um, and that was just one of the pictures that we took as part of the photo novella. Uh, and what it is, is Kiss discovers that there's a concert they cleverly disguise John Denver as John Cleveland. And they think that the world is just getting so boring that they go out and they put up posters for a fake John Cleveland concert. And when everybody shows up, Kiss comes out and plays rock and roll and saves the world. So that was where the picture came from. And it actually came out in the magazine and that's where Kiss didn't see it until it came out in the magazine. And then they called me up and said, can we use that for the album cover? So it turned out to be one of the more iconic uh, Kiss photos in the end because, uh, they rarely wear any costume at all other than their super costume, uh, their kiss costume. Uh, but I've taken pictures of them in the suits. I took pictures of them in the kimonos in Japan. And more recently, I did a picture of Jean also in a kimono for a Japanese uh, magazine cover. Um, you know, I wanted to uh, share something with you um, because this is some, I, I, I wanted to let you know that not only are you a very special person to, the world of rock and roll, but you are very special to people that you just meet. Um, mm -hmm. There's someone, uh, Philippa Porto, who um, said that she met you um, oh. and uh, she was inspired by your story, your artistry, your creativity. And she said that she wanted to, you know, to, to do something like what you did. And you told her, okay, go there and do it. <laughs> and so she got her camera and that phrase moved her so much that she, uh, she had it tattooed and it inspires her um, huh. all the time. So, yeah. you know, that's something, a very special you know, story among many stories that people are sharing. And, you know, this is, this goes to show that you are a source of in inspiration for a lot of people. And I want, I was just curious, who was the inspiration for you? Um, well, specifically, I, I don't know any one person, um, uh, other than my mom and dad who encouraged me to, you know, go out and do what I wanted to do. My mom, uh, was not only a lawyer, but she became president of many organizations. Um, and, uh, they always encouraged me to, uh, you know, to be aggressive, to get out there and do what you want to do. My mom said, I, she always said, I don't care what you want, what you do, just as long as you're the best. So I always had to try to be the best. <laughs> and uh, and that, that's, I think, uh, something that really inspired me um, to try to, you know, do a really good job all the time and that's, not be haphazard about it. 
That's amazing. I, I think that we can all use more of, um, of sage wisdom like that. Um, you know, we're coming to the close of the hour and I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. Bob Gruen, it's been a huge honor to have you with us. And I just wanna remind everyone that if you're interested in Bob's book, Right Place, Right Time, The Life of a Rock and Roll Photographer, the link to order is in the chat box. If you're interested in any other programs presented by the National Arts Club, you can visit our YouTube channel you can also go to nationalartsclub.org. Uh, Bob Gruen's website is bobgruen.com. I am Angela Louie, and thank you for joining us. Well, thank Bye -bye. you. Okay.